Hello, my dear ones. We have a problem here. We have a very interesting problem, which is very rare. The ancestors who've lived in this place have encountered this problem before, and it's been passed down in writing, but we've never actually seen it ourselves. This white disk just appeared out of the mighty clouds yesterday, and it's just doing strange things to everything, like like there are new colors everywhere, and uh, lambs are just jumping about, and dogs get excited, and birds get excited, and uh, something is happening with our skin. It, it doesn't feel moldy anymore. And um, yeah, it, it, it gets in our eyes. I don't quite know what this is. I understand um, those ancestors were calling it sun. Um, but don't worry, I think we'll be safe, because uh, in a day or two, the almighty clouds will be back, and then I think on Sunday we'll get some snow, and by Tuesday, oh, glory be to God, the winds and some proper rain will return, so then everything will be in order, then everything will be the way it should be. Oh, you see another effect of this white disc of light is that um, I get silly. <laughs> Although what I want to talk to you about today is not silly at all, it's actually extremely important and um, I do hope that who needs to hear this will hear it. Sometimes we get emails from people who would like to come and be with us at the monastery for a while in order to discern their vocation. This is the most common way in which they describe uh, the process. And I want to say something to all of you today, something that I've been telling them, each and every one of them, in my emails. Because I think it is important, and I think it could clarify a lot. One does not discern whether or not one is supposed to be a monastic. You know in your heart, clearly, if you are to be a monastic or not, the same way you know in your heart if you are supposed to enter a union with a man or with a woman and become husband and wife and find your salvation that way. It's, it's not a matter of logic. It's not a matter of um, analysis of any kind. It's a matter of love. If you fall in love with a man or with a woman and that love sets your heart on fire, then there's no discernment to be made. You enter that union. You ask God to bless it through the sacrament of marriage, and you find your salvation that way. And the same thing applies with monastic life. If your heart is on fire with love for Christ, to the point that you simply cannot imagine being in love with a human being, to the point of entering a union with that human being for the rest of your life, you want to give yourself wholly and exclusively to Christ. If that is what you feel, there's no discernment to be made anymore. There is a process of discernment when it comes to where you should leave this union with Christ. Of course, some monasteries will be right for you, and other monasteries will be wrong for you. Some spiritual fathers will be right for you, and will, others will be wrong for you, and so on and so forth. The Holy Fathers even ask us to be careful uh, to the climate of the place, for instance, because that is an important factor. If you are going to be in that monastery for the rest of your life, it is important that, like a good soldier, you make a good plan. But whether or not you are going to be a monastic, that's not a process of discernment. That is a question of where your heart resides. Whom do you love? Who sets your heart on fire? Christ or another human being? There are three main risks, three disastrous, actually, risks, that uh, come with a misunderstanding of this. If you approach the question of, should I be a monastic with care, if you approach this question with care and you try to play it safely, three things will happen. The first thing is that you are not going to have the madness 
that is required at the very beginning. You have to be mad in order to give yourself to Christ. You have to be mad to enter a life which is defined as death. Death to the world, death to your family, death to your very self. It takes madness, proper madness. It takes a level of being in love with Christ that can only be described as madness in order for you to make it work. And the fathers are very clear about it. They use the words love and madness, fire and so on in order to describe this. You need that madness to make it through the difficulty of the first years. That's the main risk, that without that fire, you will simply not be able to make the jump between the world and, and Christ. It's as if you want to jump, because we've used that expression, you, you see there's a chasm, there's, there's a cliff here, and there's another cliff over here, and a great chasm in between. And you want to jump from here to over there, but the way you do it is in approaching the end of the first cliff with tiny little steps and looking down and asking yourself, I wonder if I can jump over there. And then little step by little step you approach the end of the cliff, and then standing you want to jump to the other side. It's not going to work. I can tell you now, it's not going to work. The only way you can make it work is by just closing your eyes, putting your faith and your trust in Christ, and then running from a great distance all the way to the end of that first cliff, and then jumping with all your might, and trusting that Christ will take you upon his wings. <laughs> Look, there's a wind. And just, just push you all the way uh, on the other side. If you're careful about it, if you take things in little tiny um, steps that are not based on trust, you're doing what you're doing what Saint Peter did when he trusted Christ. He walked on water. When he started to investigate what's going on, and he looked around him and he saw the great waves, and he realized the the fact that he's doing something impossible to human nature, then he started to sink into the water. The other risk, of course, is that underneath this cautious approach, this attempt to jump step by step, if that can be even imagined, is that underneath it all there's um, a sense of fear, a fear that somehow the new life might change us, might transform who we are. And underneath that fear, there's a dragon hidden, the dragon of self-love and self-idolatry. Monastic life and married life have this in common. In both cases, they transform, they change the person to the point of death. The person who enters a marriage is not going to be the person who has survived the marriage at the end of that person's life. And similarly, the person who enters a monastery is not going to be the same person who meets Christ before his throne at the end of his life. Monastic life and married life are meant to be transformative, are meant to change who we are. The married person will become who the other person uh, needs him to be. We become, the married people become, according to the image of the other person, you learn to be strong where the other person is weak. You need to be who he or she needs you to be in order for the marriage to survive and for the marriage to be a blessed union. And the same thing happens in the monastic life. It cannot be avoided. To want to leave the monastic life outside change, to want to preserve who you are at the beginning of, of your monastic life, till the end of your monastic life, is, is a monstrosity, spiritually speaking, because the basis of monastic life is that we die to the self. The service of tonsuring a new monastic incorporates elements of the funeral service for that reason. 
It incorporates elements of the funeral service, the baptism service, when you receive the new name, the new identity, who you are now in Christ alone, and also elements of the wedding service, because your soul is being wedded to Christ. <sighs> of course, you see, these two put together a cautious approach to monastic life and fear of change, idolatry of self, they combine and, um, and they turn what could have been a blessing into a disaster, into a horrible experience. This is why so many people end up in divorce. This is why so few of those who attempt to live the monastic life actually succeed. Because things should happen like this. You have to embrace change. You have to embrace the death that is brought to you with the blessing of Christ through the sacrament of marriage or through the tonsuring into the monastic life. Because who you are today is not going to, to be who you will be next year. Who you are today is not going to survive the temptations of next year. But who you become by embracing change, who you become by the time next year comes along, that new person, that new resurrected version of you can sustain, can survive those temptations which are necessary for your further growth. If you want to survive marriage without change, then two things alone can happen. Either that marriage is not a proper marriage, because marriage by definition should be transformative. I've told you that uh, the monastic tonsure incorporates elements of uh, the funeral service. The marriage service is dedicated to the holy martyrs, those who have died for the sake of Christ. If you want to go through your married life or through your monastic life without changing, without dying, without the person who you were at the beginning disappearing, so that a new resurrected person just is given to you as a gift, as a grace from Christ alone by the end of your monastic life or your marriage, if you want to do that, you will either fail or the marriage will fail or the monastic life will fail. This cautious approach, both to the monastic life and to marriage, is responsible for most failures of both. This cautious approach where you waste years of your life investigating, trying to make sense in a human way of something that has nothing to do with this world, but with the age to come particularly when it comes to the monastic life, which is the angelic life. This is doomed to fail from the very beginning. Our brains cannot investigate a reality that has to do with the kingdom. Our brains can investigate, as I've told you before, the place where you can live your monastic life, or the person to whom you vow your obedience. But whether or not you go ahead and you, you make that jump that cannot be investigated with the tools of this world. That choice is made as a blind act of faith and trust and love for Christ. You close your eyes and you start running and when the time comes, you make the jump and Christ himself will carry you over that chasm onto the other side. God is with us. And if we don't found our monastic life, and indeed our married life as well, if we don't found our life on this trust that God is with us, then we are founding it on our own tools and our own abilities. and. Um, we are condemning our lives to failure from the very beginning. Build your eternal life on stone, my brother and my sister. Put the foundation 
of your eternal life, on the stone of just blindly trusting in Christ, not on the sand of our um, ever-failing nature, our ever-changing nature. God is with us. Let this be the backbone, the guiding light in all your storms and all your darkness. The knowledge, the perfect knowledge in faith, in trust and love, that God is with us, my brother and my sister. God is with us, nations and be There is no 
mighty God, he that has authority, the Prince of Peace.